I'm Alex Bloomberg. This is Startup, the show about what it's really like to start a business. We are towards the end of our special Gimlet-themed mini-season. And we started Gimlet a little over a year ago. In that time, we've grown from a company that consisted of me and my co-founder, Matt, to a company of 27 full-time employees. Of that 27, 14 are women, 13 are men. Of our current and near future hosts, there are five men and five women. In off-air leadership roles, there are three men and two women. Also, of the 27 total, 24 are white. Only three of the 27 are non-white. Two Asian Americans, one African American. We have nobody on staff who identifies as Hispanic. By the way, just because this is audio, I don't want to assume anything. I'm one of the white ones. This is what we're going to be talking about today on the program. And just as an aside, I'm going to be using the terms white and non-white a lot. I know the terminology is imprecise. Whiteness is a construct. We're actually going to get into that a little even. This year, if our projections are correct, we will double in size. I want the next 27 people we hire to be less white than the last 27. It's a priority for us. It's a priority because we are a media company with a large audience doing narrative journalism in a country where race and ethnicity permeate every facet of our culture and politics, from Donald Trump talking about immigrants to Nicki Minaj and Taylor Swift to Freddie Gray and Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Black Lives Matter. We have an obligation to do right by the stories we'll be telling, to tell them not just from one perspective, but with all the nuance and complexity they deserve. It's also a priority because the country and the world is getting less white. The U.S. right now is almost 40% non-white. In a couple decades, non-white will be the majority. Just from a business perspective, it's idiotic not to have our staff and our hosts reflect the makeup of the listeners we're trying to reach. I've worked in lots of jobs in media, and every place I've worked has been pretty white. At every place I've worked, there have been occasional conversations about diversity, about how the organization wants more of it. More than once, every person in those conversations was white. A bunch of white people having a conversation about how there's too many white people. It can make you start to wonder, what are we hoping to accomplish here? I wanted to have a different conversation about diversity, a conversation that actually included the non-white people here at Gimlet. And so I asked all three non-white Gimlet employees if they'd feel comfortable talking about diversity with me on the podcast. I made it clear that this was optional, that they were more than welcome to say no, but they all said yes. So on this program, I'll be playing parts of all these conversations. And I want to stress, this is a tiny data set. These are three different people with three very different experiences. And it seems ridiculous to say this, but it probably bears being said just the same. Just as I don't speak for all white people, they do not speak for all the people with whom they share a background. This episode is nothing more than what it is. Three people of color bravely diving into a sometimes awkward conversation with their white CEO about race and diversity. So let's start here. Have, did you have you noticed how how um, white it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. It's yeah. evident. This is Brittany Luce, the host of Gimlet's next show, which comes out in early January. It's called Sampler. She and a guest host play clips from some of the best stuff out there in the podcasting world and do guest interviews. In addition to that show that she's doing for us, she hosts a podcast in her spare time with her best friend Eric called For Colored Nerds: Conversations Black People Have When White People Aren't in the Room. And I'm a fan of For Colored Nerds. That's how Brittany and I met, actually. I reached out to her and Eric after enjoying the show for a while. Several months later, when we were looking for a host for Sampler, I asked her if she'd be interested in applying. She had a non-radio day job she wasn't into, so she said yes. In hindsight, I realized how quick it all was, because I think you reached out to us in March. Seven months ago, you guys emailed us for the first time. Right. Yeah. When Brittany came to work here, she found herself at a new company in a new field with new colleagues, none of whom were black. What's more, most people at Gimlet come from careers in public radio. Brittany had been in marketing. The podcast was something she did in her spare time. So in the beginning, she said she felt out of place, mostly because she didn't share the same professional background as everyone around her. But three months into her tenure, that was starting to change. I can see the ways in which I'm different from other people on staff. And like, it doesn't just have to do with the fact that I, like, I'm just not working in radio for the first time. I didn't even want to talk about this, but there was one day where, like, I didn't get a Gimlet guide, which is, like, this, like, you know, I guess for people listening. It's, like, this internal program that we have where new hires get matched up with, like, people who've been here for longer. 
Right. They're the person that the that yeah. the other person can go to to ask questions about like what the hell's going on here, where's the bathroom, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so like I don't I d I don't like I can't say necessarily that like that like I was overlooked in any specific you know, I can't say that for certain. Technically it was started shortly after I was brought on. Right. But like we don't have a large organization. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's not like and also like I am the only black person here, so you can't like miss me. But like things like that, or like you know, we're figuring out the the company roster, or whatever. I wasn't on it. You, but like w- w- you weren't on the company roster. When, no. when did that happen? Um, when? I think it got sent around a couple weeks ago. And like you know, if you weren't on it, you just had to like write your name. And so I wrote my name in or whatever. But it was right. just like I asked for a Gimlet guide the same day that like I was left off the company roster, and I was just like, Ugh. like those things are. I don't know how to describe it. Those things may have been oversights, but like. Weirdly, like, I kind of assumed for some reason that I would be, like, forgotten from it. But, like, I can't necessarily verbalize to you specifically why. Like, I'm used to being overlooked. Do you know what I mean? And, like, like it's, like, weird because, like, I feel almost, like, nervous and guilty talking to you about this. Even though I know, like, in my principles who I am as a person, this is, this is something that I care a lot about. And, like, I'm in an, I'm, I have literally <laughs> your full attention right now. <laughs> and I can talk about it and I can, I can ask for it. But, like, it still feels very scary. What, what's the scary part? There's always a fear when talking to white people about race, yeah. especially white people that help you pay your bills. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, this, that, like, you'll turn them off, that you will scare them, that you will offend them, that you will upset them. That's, like, a very serious fear that I cannot help but have. Right. Yeah. Like, it makes sense not for me, for me not to talk to my boss about this Strangely enough, I've been encouraged today, but <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think it's like I think, you know, with the Gimlet Guide thing, I want to be like, oh, that had nothing to do with race. That was just this oversight, you yeah. know, like all that sort of stuff, right? And that may be true. That's probably true. Yeah. But I also feel like the only reason I want to do that is to make myself feel better. Yeah, that's like that's and the other that's thing the is thing, like, and not to acknowledge whether or not that actually whether something is going on, whether there is some sort of weird not weird, like something clearly apparent throughout the world, yeah. scientifically like, backed up, <laughs> unconscious bias, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, that's yeah. not, like, yeah. it's not weird at all. Yeah. But it's also the uncomfortable part of it. Yeah. And this may be too big a reach, so let me... But oh, like right, this is, I'm here. But I feel like the uncomfortable part about it is that by bringing that up, yeah. you're saying that maybe you guys are racist, in some ways, well, not 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 no, not. No, I understand not, what you're saying. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Not, you not, not 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 that like not that you're saying like you're racist like yeah. in that way. But like, either it was an oversight or there was some something else was going on, right? Yeah. Well, this is the thing is like no matter how hard you try, unconscious bias exists, and social conditioning tells people that so, like a young black woman does not have this job, does not work here, does not seem very public radio, does not seem podcasting, does not seem like she would be a host. All of those assumptions like are very thick in the air before any interaction happens. All of that exists. So like part of like actively working on this is not just bringing the people in, but also like doing the work within the organization, doing the work within your networks and doing the work within yourself to like always be trying to check for that. Always be trying to check for that. It's a good piece of advice. And as the white person in the mix here, I should say that when something happens like what happened with Brittany, I, and I would imagine a lot of white people, really want to not see it in racial terms. I know that every part of me didn't want to see it that way. I wanted it to be an easily explained oversight because that's the story that makes me feel better. But if you're the person like Brittany that this is happening to over and over and over again, the story I tell myself to make myself feel better can make you feel worse. Like I'm denying a reality that you know to be true. And the truth is, the science says it's not just an oversight, not every time anyway. Study after study shows we all carry unconscious bias around with us. Probably the more we acknowledge the truth of that racist in our subconscious, the less inadvertently racist we can be in real life. Now, if I hadn't been talking to Brittany for this podcast, I doubt she would have brought that up with me. But every person I talked to had had an experience like that, where they were wondering, is this something that happened because of my race? 
or just because. And what you do in your own mind when faced with that moment, when faced with a potential case of unconscious bias, it's tricky. Lisa Chow had a story about that. Lisa, remember, is one of my co-hosts on Startup. She's back from her maternity leave and working on a new season, following a new company. She's worked for over a decade in journalism, much of it in the same largely white public radio world that I inhabited. And she had to decide early on what to do about unconscious bias. I remember at one time at NPR, this is when I first uh, worked at NPR, Morning Edition, I was, you know, at the bottom of the totem pole as a booker. Um, There were three bookers. um, And I had been assigned to cover business. Mm -hmm. And business was kind of like the bottom of the totem pole segment. And no one listened to it because Marketplace covered it up most of the time for most stations. And... um, there was another producer who's not white, and she pulled me aside. She's like, okay, see those two other bookers? They're white. The senior editor who's managing all of you is white. They're getting assigned to these other segments that are kind of more important, and you're assigned to the business segment, and so why do you think that is? You know, and I remember thinking, like, well, number one, I'm the only person with any kind of business kind of background or knowledge, you know, I had an applied math degree and I went to, I took courses at, you know, Harvard Business School. Like I was, so I, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything unusual about the fact that I was the one covering business. Um, but she was like, oh, you're Asian. They're kind of ghettoizing you. And and so it did sit with me for a little bit, for maybe like a week. And I started thinking about it and I was like, oh, I I can't think this way. Like, this is toxic thinking. Right, right. I I kind of let my head go down that path, and I was like, that is a scary path. What's scary about it? I think the dangerous part is that I, I could see it creating resentment, frustration, anger, hatred, and then, and then not feeling motivated. If that were the case, if this senior editor had specifically said, okay, (laughs) I mean, not intentional, but whatever, hidden bias, unconscious bias was like, okay, this this Asian (laughs) woman is going to cover business. um, And then these two women, you know, are going to be doing kind of more high profile segment A stuff. I mean, I don't know. Then you're just kind of at a loss. The you know, as an Asian woman, you know, I'm out of that club. Like, end of story, done. So I felt bad, but I really, like, did not want to be friends with her. Mm -hmm. I just felt like her thinking and her talking in those terms all the time, um, like, in this kind of racial, in these racial terms all the time. I mean, she really saw everything racially. Mm -hmm. Um, Was just going to... Like, fuck with me. One other place where the question, is this because of my race, can crop up, is when you're hired. When the job offer was made, I remember thinking, is it because I'm good or is it because I'm a brown woman? Like, is that one of the things that's giving me a leg up? This is Reply All producer Sruthi Pinamanini, who's Indian. She's talking about when she was hired here at Gimlet. I think I'm a good producer, for sure. And, but I imagine also when you're hiring someone, you do think, yeah, this person is different than the other people we have on staff. And and that is a point in my favor, or several points. But I think that's the sort of that gets to the core of the whole issue with the diversity question, right? Because you want what's best for your company, you want to hire the best people. At the same time, you have to think about how the company looks. Yeah. Well, I, yes, that is something that happens. Like, is that weird? It's weird when you're the person who yeah. gets the extra points because. Oh, it's so I I feel mixed about it. You yeah, know? being chosen for in any way your ethnic attributes is I don't know. It feels weird. Now, just to underline how complicated this can all get, Sruthi was bothered by the idea of her race being at all a factor in the hiring process. But in my conversation with Brittany, 
it was clear that she felt differently. Targeting, to me, to me speaking for myself, I think, I think targeting is fine. I myself, I was still a little uncomfortable with it. And I talked to Brittany about my own discomfort over what Sruthi had mentioned, the awkwardness of targeting someone because of their skin color. Fundamentally, it's a weird thing to be... The, the, the whole reason it's like this in America is because of, like, a, you know, a long history of sort of, you know, like <laughs> I'm bad <familiar>. shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm right? So We talk so, about it sometimes on my show. Yeah, I've heard. I've yeah. Heard, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and the long history involved, you know, white people looking at other and non-white people and judging them by the color of their skin. Yeah. Right? Like, that's, like, sort of the fundamental problem is sort of, like, whole groups of people were disenfranchised, not seen as, yeah. not seen as fully human because of the, their background or the color of their yeah, skin. Yeah, yeah, Right? Yeah. So that's the... That's that's the fundamental problem. Yeah. And then one of the major issues. Yeah. yeah. And then to try to sort of like make one small sort of attempt to sort of fix that problem in your organization yeah. involves targeting people because of the color of their skin in a certain yeah. way. But you like, know what I mean? And like, not, not that's a bad. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that a great deal of the people who feel uncomfortable about that are probably white people, though. Right. Because I, I don't feel if, if, if I don't I, I don't feel uncomfortable by, with anybody targeting Anything that doesn't that doesn't you know I mean like there's one thing it's one thing targeting is one thing tokenism is another right you know what I mean yes yeah yeah talk yeah. more about that distinction okay like so when, targeting like, is like we're tr- we're actively trying to make our organization less white so we're going to do these things uh-huh. um and because we're actively trying to we're trying to go outside of our networks and go outside what is traditional to find talented people who are not white right um targeting is fine for me tokenism is like. You know, we got to have one. We got Brittany. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. We're going to stop now. Exactly. If right. you guys, like, stopped at me and I had to continue <laughs> explaining what Netflix and chill means <laughs> and how it's much older than, like, the past three weeks, that would be that would be tokenism, and I don't know how much I could take that. I'll, like, I worked – someplace oh. I worked in the past. I was not on the executive team. I was, like, on the manager. I was, like, you know, mid-level manager, but I wasn't on the executive uh-huh. team. And they were redoing their website, and they were trying to, like – figure out who from the executive team is going to have their photo on the website. And like, I, like the, I was, I was, I was, it was suggested that I, my photo be on the website. And I knew, I knew why. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I knew why. It's because like, there weren't enough, there weren't enough people of color, let alone black people on the executive team to like, make the website look diverse enough where somebody might want to work there. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, So like, they just, they like stuck me. I was, there's no reason for me to be on that website. There's no reason for me to be on that website, but I was there. A lot of people get to, they hit tokenism and then they stop. Right. Yeah. That's a really good, um. It's just, you should these, you should, like, you should coin that. To yeah, you, that's like, totally that, to like me. yes, that's a medium post right there or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> targeting should. versus tokenism. Yeah, yeah, remember that. I'll remember Trade that. Trade market. That's yes, good. Yes, I should. Clearly, Sruthi's experience as an Indian woman and Brittany's experience as an African American are very different, officially different even. When colleges recruit minority students, they'll often subdivide them into minorities and underrepresented minorities, which is usually Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. And, of course, it's insane to be lumping all non-white people into the same diversity bucket. Or to be lumping people into buckets at all. But most corporations and other large organizations who are trying to look more diverse will make do with anyone who can possibly count as diversity. This comes up in our household, frankly, because my wife, Nazanin, has been the subject of some of these conversations at other places she's worked. She's been asked to be in public pictures for the organization she's worked at. People have wondered aloud whether she counts as diversity. And we don't even know ourselves where we come down on the question of whether or not we're in interracial marriage or not. On those official forms where you have a box to check for race, sometimes Nazneen writes white, sometimes she writes other. I cannot tell you on a day-to-day basis how she will answer the question. On the one hand, of course, she's not white, at least not the way I am or the way the white people she grew up around in a very white suburb of Minneapolis were white. She's an immigrant. Her parents spoke a different language, made different food, thought the American practice of sleepovers was insane that your kid would spend the night unsupervised in some stranger's house? Who does that? Nazneen was the only one of her classmates that had to go to her own parent-teacher conferences in order to translate what her teachers were saying about her. On the other hand, Iranians, Persians, many of them check the white box without thinking about it. And when our children are grown, I'm pretty sure that's the one they'll check too. And anyway, Nazneen's experience growing up is vastly different than an African-American's experience or a Hispanic-American's experience. Here at Gimlet, we ended up, for the purposes of this story, not counting Nazneen as diversity. On the day we were telling things up, when we asked her if she was white, she said yes. 
And Sruthi Pinamanani and Lisa Chow, they feel a lot like Nazneen. As Asians, Sruthi and Lisa are officially in a different ethnic category, but they each told me that they felt their difference actually benefited them in the workplace. In other words, it was a point in their favor. And yet they did recognize that they bring a different perspective than the white people here at Gimlet, and that that different perspective is valuable. Here's Sruthi. There's one time I can remember where it came up in a way where I thought, oh, that's why we need to have more hosts who are of color or women, where it felt as if being a white man was something that, that how should I put it, I don't want to say negatively affected the story, but I, I did feel as if it held the story back. Which was that? So it was, it was a story that we did that involved... Um, this is on Reply All. This is on Reply All. Yeah. So it was on a story that involved race... And the guys were interviewing a woman who was not white. And there were moments where I wanted them to push back a little bit. I was thinking, like, this is the question that I would ask. And they didn't. And so afterwards, I I said, hey, why didn't you say, why didn't you push back a little bit on this idea or that one? And they were like, are you kidding me? (laughs) You know, can you imagine, like, two white dudes, like, interviewing a, a woman of color and saying, like disagreeing with her really and i could see that i was like oh right you would be the assholes and the internet would hate you and only a person who you know i could do that sruthi also echoed something that lisa chow told me that the more diversity you have at an organization the less uptight it has to be around the issue of race there's just one or two people of color. There's this weird dynamic. The people of color might just keep their heads down, speak super carefully for fear that one of these white people is going to say something accidentally offensive. And then there's a whole bunch of white people speaking super carefully for fear that the people of color are going to make them feel bad for saying something accidentally offensive. But Lisa told me that the one time she worked in a newsroom where the ratio was a little bit better, having a few more people of color, it relaxed the entire conversation. Race didn't have to be something you tiptoed so carefully around. You know, there were a, f- a few producers and reporters who were, who were you know, people of color. And I, I don't know, it's just like the, the banter between us <laughs> was not that it was like fundamentally different from the banter between like me and someone who is white. But there's like maybe a little bit more freedom you can have in the sense that like I know he he or she is not going to take offense by things. I don't know. It's like I don't have to be as buttoned up on certain issues. Like we would just make fun of each other and trash talk each other in a way that like a white person probably couldn't do that with like another, <laughs> you know. I don't know. It, it, do you know what I'm saying? Like uh-huh. it's 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 the freedom to make an <laughs> ethnic joke. <laughs> <laughs> and not have awful? it become a human resources issue. <laughs> that was a bad example of just saying we can make racist jokes. <laughs> I mean, it's not that we can just make racist jokes, but like we can actually have kind of like heated conversations in a way that I don't know, it's just like it's just a kind of a much more open dialogue where you can really challenge people on the assumptions that they have. It's like guilt-free kind of conversation. I mean, we should be able to do that regardless of race, right? But I feel like in today's culture, we can't. But the freedom to be more honest and open in the workplace, it can also lead to more conflict in the workplace. That's another thing the research says. More diverse workplaces come up with more creative solutions to problems. They also fight a little bit more. Coming up, how you can be a middle-class white guy and still be in the minority, at least in Brooklyn, New York. That's after these words from our sponsor. This episode of Startup is brought to you by PC Does What? And this week, we're talking to PC user Matt Friedman, who lives four hours from the nearest big city and works both his jobs remotely on his PC. 
He spends 14 to 16 hours a day on it. It's his life. If someone broke into the house, they could, right, they could have everything else that is sort of precious, but not my computer. They could have all of like the pictures from our wedding. Now, choosing your computer over your wedding pictures, it doesn't sound very romantic. But Matt swore his wife would say the same thing about her PC. So I asked him to prove it. I could, uh, I could text her. Yeah, text her. Hey, random question. If our house were burglarized and you had... While we're waiting, it seems like a good moment to talk about the next generation of PCs. They feature Intel's sixth generation processor, the fastest yet. Also, extended battery life and ultra high definition graphics. Or our wedding album. In a couple minutes after Matt pressed send, my wife just texted back and she said she would have them steal the wedding album instead of her computer. <laughs> I was wrong. It is romantic. PC does what no PC has done before. Does yours? Learn more at pcdoeswhat.com. This week's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers. Audible.com is offering our listeners a free 30-day trial membership. Recently, we read a book to our five-year-old son, a classic by E.B. White, Stuart Little. Our son loved it, but man, it is a weird book. It's about a family where the mom gives birth to a mouse and everyone pretends like it's totally normal. When Mrs. Frederick C. Little's second son arrived... Everybody noticed that he was not much bigger than a mouse. The truth of the matter was, the baby looked very much like a mouse in every way. He was only about two inches high. And he had a mouse's sharp nose, a mouse's tail, a mouse's whiskers, and the pleasant, shy manner of a mouse. Our son was confused, but loved it. Go to audible.com slash startup to start your free trial today. Show your support for startup and get a free 30-day trial all at once at audible.com slash startup. Startup. Welcome back to Startup. I spent a couple of days talking with Gimlet employees about diversity and what their experience had been like. And it felt like the conversations were going pretty well, that we were covering a lot of ground. And then I got an email that made me realize, oh, wait, this conversation is even bigger than I thought. It came from our chief of staff, Chris Giliberti. I'm Chris Giliberti. Uh I make the models and the PowerPoint slides. (laughs) (laughs) So we're doing this episode on workplace diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, we had not talked to you initially. And tell me how you felt about that. Oh, okay. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just sort of, I just was wondering what the scope of the conversation around diversity was because, mm-hmm. yeah, because I hadn't been talked to. And up until very recently, I was the only LGBT person on the staff. So I thought, mm-hmm. oh, okay, like, is that something that's coming my way or not? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So adding LGBT to the diversity equation, we have two openly gay men on staff, but there might be other people who aren't out. One thing that's different about sexual orientation diversity, race, it's something that's often publicly apparent. Sexual orientation maybe isn't. If you're an LGBT person on staff, but you're not you're not open or out, you might not like integrate with the community. Mm-hmm. Because like even even though nobody knows, like you just might internally feel uncomfortable. Right. Do you feel like at a company like this in media in New York City at in, at this point in time, there are people who would be afraid to, like, come out to their coworkers. Oh, yeah, for sure. For because, sure. Because, I mean, because it's, a, because it's such a personal thing. Right. Not because, like, Alex Bloomberg is going to feel, is going to be homophobic. That wouldn't be the fear. Right. It'd be that, like, when you do that, yeah, sure, Alex is cool, but, like, what if he tells somebody and then what if my parents find out? It's, like, this whole, like, right. personal world of considerations, not yes. not necessarily, like, it, this place not being safe. Now, as Chris and I were talking, something happened. We were going deep, as you can do in conversations like this, into the definition of diversity. And at a certain point, I said this. One of the other things that I think about, and I wonder, I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Like one, you know, like diversity gets mentioned a lot, and like one of the things that, but one of the ways that it doesn't get brought up, and this is something that I'm struck, wrestling with too, is like I bet you if you were to survey the staff, and this includes anybody that we'd bring on, any people of color, and the vast majority of the staff is sort of like politically liberal, cosmopolitan, and leaning, you know, sort of like. Brooklyn based, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. we're we are not at all culturally diverse, I guess if you want to say, you know, like or sort of at least uh, or yeah, I don't know, religiously diverse, mm-hmm. uh politically diverse. We don't have any evangelicals on staff, I don't think. Um maybe we do. 
Um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't really think so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and that, that's a huge part of the population. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I don't think we have anybody who could name one NASCAR driver. I don't think, we, you know what I mean? The conversation continued. Chris is on the business side. He and I were musing about the business implications of religious podcasts. There are a lot of them. Is that a business we'd ever want to get into? And if so, what would that mean? And at some point, Chris said, we probably would want to do some real hard thinking on who our audience is and who they're not. And if we decide, based on audience research, that evangelicals are not a group we want to focus on, maybe we discard them. Meaning, maybe we don't put them into our strategic planning as a core audience that we want to build. Then we finished the conversation, and I asked my producer, Eric, if there was anything that we'd missed. Um, hey, Eric, is there anything else that you... Is there anything else that we should say? Eric had been doing what a producer does, yeah, listening to the conversation the entire time outside of the booth through headphones. And he came in and asked if we could turn on a mic for him. I was sitting outside the studio listening, uh, uh-huh. as is my job for yeah. these things. And you guys started talking about religious diversity in the workplace, which was fine and interesting. But you started talking about basically writing off populations, essentially, because we just have to decide, like, who are we going to, what are we going to value as a company and who are we going to target as our audience member and what are we going to develop content around? And, like, that that worried me Uh a little bit when you guys started talking about that. You know, Alex, you, you said, I don't think we have any evangelicals on staff I grew up going to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, uh-huh. and I am still a practicing Christian, and uh-huh. I go to church every Sunday. Uh-huh. Um, I have a like life group that meets in the middle of the week, and half of us are startup listeners, oh, cool. mind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, lot, a lot of startup fans. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrific. Right. I can also name a couple of NASCAR drivers. Yeah, I was, like, was going to say, I was like, I was actually, I was like, pod Thank that pause. God pa- we have you on when, There we go. When you, when, you, when you heard that pause, I was like, actually, I bet you, Derek, Eric can name some NASCAR drivers. Uh, but, uh, but I think, I don't know that you want to cater to people who have the same beliefs as Rush Limbaugh. Like, right. you don't want to cater to, like, radical beliefs in any sense like that's not what we're trying to do yeah. but like something like 71 percent of americans identify as christian yeah and that's that's like large. there's a yeah. large variety of christian out there how many people in the office know that you go to church every sunday do you think probably a handful do you ever feel strange telling people no less than three times did I, like, stand up from my desk outside with my headphones on listening in, think about knocking on the door, and then, like, no, 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 I'll sit back down, uh-huh. you know? When you said, I don't know if we have any evangelicals on staff or anybody you can— I almost, like, walked around almost to the window here so you could see me, thought about waving, I'm like, no, 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 not right, yeah. not right, not right. I guess there's always a tinge of discomfort. Like, there's always a little bit of discomfort when it comes up. And what is that discomfort? Are you worried about, like, incurring judgment in some way or another? Is that something that you're— that you're worried about? I guess there's a fear about not being taken seriously Uh to some extent because you believe in something that, like, some very smart people discount as complete hokum, you know, that you are therefore associated with that, Mm -hmm. you know. As a Christian, for me at least, there's a a feeling of responsibility to be open about your faith and to not cower when it's easier to cower because it's much easier to deny Christ. You know, it's Uh much more comfortable. Right. There's an argument that every conversation you have, you should act as if anyone can hear you. In radio, it's actually sort of an occupational hazard. Anyone who's worked in the field for a while has been caught in front of an open mic saying something behind someone's back that you wouldn't to their face. The funny thing, when you're caught doing that, it sometimes prompts a conversation that ends up being pretty productive. See, this is so interesting because this is like, you asked me whether I, you know, I would ever be nervous or anxious that I would overhear something that I wouldn't like. Or if, you know, you're not out in the workplace, like maybe someone would be make, make, make a homophobic joke. I think there's way less risk of that here in this particular environment than someone saying something that would be really offensive to Eric. Yeah. Do you agree with that, that there's more of a a chance of that happening here than— That it's harder for you to come out as a Christian than it is for you to come out as a gay person. In this particular environment. Or, I mean, not that there should even be a comparison, but, like, that there is, like— No. 
one of my jobs, like uh, uh, several years ago, we were interviewing a candidate, and I was down in Virginia, and the candidate came down from the Northeast, and and they asked, is this a pretty conservative place? And I'm like, well, actually, this is like a very liberal town in a very conservative state. And this person was like, oh, that's good because I'm gay and I don't want to get hate crimed, which is like not a thing I've ever thought. I didn't think I was going to come to Brooklyn and get hate crimed because I'm a Christian, right. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that way, like the struggle is not the same. Right. It is not the same. And I recognize it's not the same. And I feel weird bringing it up in that regard. But, you know, as the gay person in the room, like I'm saying, like, I think it's as important. And I, I don't know how you quantify Level of importance, like, yes, like, I'm more likely to get hate crimed in certain parts of the country than than you are, right? That's true. But, like, at the end of the day, it's all very individualized, and I think that all of these things are really important. And I think that's why it's, like, always really important to just go back to the core objectives of a diversity strategy, and if it's to make sure that people feel comfortable in the workplace, I don't think that there's any difference in the magnitude of the conversation about religious diversity or LGBT diversity. So Chris and Eric arrived at one part of our diversity strategy. We want to make sure that Gimlet is a place where you feel comfortable sharing your beliefs, be you Christian, Native American, transgender, or all of the above. But when it comes to other parts of a diversity strategy, just saying that you have a comfortable home for people isn't going to be enough. We are a largely white organization in a historically pretty white industry. If we just sit around and wait for people of color to apply for the jobs we post, we're going to stay that way. At the time of our conversation, Brittany, the host of our upcoming show, Sampler, was hiring a producer for her show. There weren't a ton of col- people of color in the pool that I had to choose from. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that I went into this like, I want to hire, you know, a woman who's exactly like me right. to work with. But, like, there wasn't a super diverse pool to choose from. Right. There are probably other networks of people that maybe didn't even make, like, that didn't even make it into the pool that I was able to yeah, choose from. for whom this is not even, this job did not even come yeah, up on the radar. Exactly, of, yeah, didn't even yeah. come up on the radar. Something I find um it's a barrier for a lot of people of color is not even knowing that this type of thing is an op- is like a is like a decent like a job you know what right I mean? right right and my parents even were like kind of like when I first started working they were like so what exactly like can you and I'm like yeah yeah no this is a real this is a real job you guys that you <laughs> right. can come back. yeah yeah exactly but like um, you're showing you my health insurance card yeah exactly <laughs> exactly I'm gonna show it to them when they come next month but yeah, they're gonna want to see it Brittany in fact would probably not have applied for the job that she herself was now trying to hire for. In fact, the way that Brittany came to work at Gimlet is probably instructive. After hearing her podcast, we reached out to her, met with her and Eric informally several times. We invited them to events that we hosted, and gradually, over time, we got to know each other. If Gimlet is to become less white, that has to become part of what we do on a regular basis. We have to add to our existing professional network, which is largely white people who we've worked with in our past careers. We have to create new professional networks that include a more diverse group of people. And creating new professional networks, that's more than just saying in your job posting that you're looking for diverse candidates. It's everything. It's down to what you listen to in your leisure time. Do you know Mm, what I'm saying? Yeah. You're always listening to What the Fuck and and Paul F. Tompkins and Radiolab and Serial. Right. Then, like, you, like, it's, it's like, even, it's that, it's that small. Yeah, I know. Um, Yeah, I know. It's like, it's a lot. Is your head, is your head hurt? No, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt because I feel like it. Because I, I, so I think that's that's clearly one of the things that we're thinking about is sort of internships, like targeted internships, mm-hmm. like trying to like just sort of like going and recruiting and recruiting at places, you know, yeah. just not like just putting the signal out there, but like actually trying, yeah, trying going. to find, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> would you? Oh that my would god, be amazing. I would. Yeah. It, nothing would make me happier than to go to my alma mater or or schools like it uh-huh. and be able to talk. Nothing would make me happier. Yeah, yeah. Look at Howard University. Brittany Luce is coming your way to talk to you about podcasting. And of course, that's part of it. A more diverse staff means that there are more professional networks to tap into. And the process of becoming less monochromatic as an organization can take on more momentum. But obviously, becoming less white is not the responsibility of the people of color on our staff. It's leadership's responsibility. And for the first time in my long career, leadership, that's me. We talk about like the phrase being quote-unquote in the room. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So if you, I don't know what that means. In the room means like, you know, people who have the, the leeway to make, people who have the, the power to make decisions. Oh, okay. So like you. I'm so in the room, I don't even yes, know what that means. Yes, exactly. You're so, <laughs> but yeah, that's so how you're, in the room I am. That's in the room you are. Yeah, so you're in the room, right? Yeah. So you are in the room with other white guys and you say like, hey, we need to do something about this. And then like, like 
progressively, then you also want like eventually not just like the office, but the room itself should think should you should Gimlet grow to accommodate like a larger group of people. Do you know what I'm saying? Let's say Gimlet grows and there's like 500 people there. If you have a a, a company of 500 people and you still have, let's say you have a board of directors of 12. Mm-hmm. If your board of directors is still ten out of twelve white guys, then you're still it's still not all the it's still not all the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you have to get to the point where like people like like you're in the room, so you have to look at another white guy and say like, hey, we need to talk about this. Like this is too white. We need to, like you, like and it's, it takes like conscious decision making. It has to be active. It has to be direct. It has mm-hmm. to be corrective. And it has to be something that that um, that you don't pat yourself on the back for. Because it has to just be, it has to be just be the way that you operate. It has to, you have to like m- do everything that you can to make it a a really a really vital part of like your practice as like a business person. Which I don't mm-hmm. even know if that's like a phrase that people use, but I'm using yeah. it now. We still have a lot to figure out about our practice as business people, and we haven't fully decided the scope of what we should be looking for in diversifying the staff. But we're taking steps to figure it out. Just this week, we hired a professional, a director of people operations who we're specifically asking to build out new, more diverse talent networks. We'll almost certainly be launching an official training program, something like a Gimlet Academy. We hope that'll come sometime in the new year. It's a long process, but I know when we get to the size that Brittany imagined us being, 500 employees, a 12-member board, the people inside that room, they won't all look like me. Startup was produced this week by me and Eric Mendel, editing from Peter Clowney and Caitlin Kenny. Special thanks this week to all the employees who talked with me about this. Thank you so much for being so honest. The show was mixed by Andrew Dunn, music by John Kimbrough and the band HotMoms.gov. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Our special ad music comes from the band Build Buildings. Our website, where you can hear all of our past episodes, is GimletMedia.com. While you're there, you can check out our other shows. We have one called Reply All. They just recently reported a story about a woman named Hope. Hope had a mysterious ailment that kept getting worse and worse. None of the doctors could help her, so she turned to strangers on the internet to try to diagnose her. A horrible catastrophe, right? Actually, something much stranger happens instead. Thanks to our sponsor, Audible.com. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. Go to audible.com slash startup to get a free 30-day trial today. That's audible.com slash startup. And thanks to our sponsor, PC Does What, a collaboration between Dell, HP, Intel, and Lenovo. Together, the next generation of PCs is doing what no PC has done before. Learn more at pcdoeswhat.com. On the next episode of Startup, Lisa Chow, who you heard here today, takes over the hosting duties. And she goes out and digs up dirt about me. Um, okay. How are you feeling? Terrified. I feel like you've been out gathering just information about questions that you can ask to make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> No, that hasn't been our only objective. (laughs) That's in a couple weeks. Be sure to check it out. And thanks for listening.